There's a lot of controversy in the church regarding evolution. I believe that evolution is God's process of creating the diversity of life. So what exactly is evolution and how does it work? What evidence do we have that evolution occurs? A great way to see evidence for evolution is to study life on island chains. Hawaii lies about 2,400 miles from any major landmass. It's the most isolated island chain in the world. It's not a surprise then that no amphibians, land reptiles, or land mammals ever got here on their own. The animals that did get here didn't have to struggle with the same predators, competitors, or diseases that they were used to. In Hawaii, they found different food sources and a variety of habitats, from the most arid of deserts to the rainiest of rainforests. They were about to embark on very new evolutionary journeys. Some of the most stunning and beautiful inhabitants of Hawaii are the honey creepers. These birds are found nowhere else in the world. It is thought that a few million years ago, a group of perhaps a hundred ancestors of the current Asian rose finches flew way off course in a large storm system toward what is now known as Kauai. This is what one of the ancestral finches may have looked like. Inside the cells of this finch are genes on its chromosomes, which we're showing here being made out of jelly beans. Each jelly bean represents a different form of a gene. Now imagine you gathered all the genes together of one finch. You'd have this small pile. Imagine you gathered all the genes of an entire population together. It'd be like having a giant bowl of jelly beans. Scientists refer to this concept as a gene pool. So this entire bowl is that population of finches in Asia. And here is that lost group of finches that got blown over to Kauai. Instantly, it started with a different assortment of traits, simply because it was only a small sample of the original. Natural selection would act on this new population in a different way in this new environment, weeding out genes that would produce harmful traits. Once in a while, a gene might change through mutation, which may cause baby birds to be born with a new advantageous trait. The genes which produce favorable traits would multiply as reproduction occurs. As new islands formed, new opportunities for this same process arose, and after many thousands of generations, they developed into different species with their own uniquely shaped beaks and feeding behaviors. In this way, gradually over a few million years, the ancestors of the rose finch evolved into 60 different species. These honey creepers look very different from each other because each species evolved to have a very different role in the environment. There are ones with absurdly long curved beaks that are now extinct. There are ones that drink nectar like hummingbirds and those that eat insects like woodpeckers. E. Evie's vibrant red feathers and salmon-colored curved beak make it look almost mythical. Its beak is perfectly shaped for the lobelia flower it drinks from. The flower also evolved to be perfectly shaped to dust pollen on E. Evie's head just as E. Evie gets that last sip of the nectar. As E. Evie moves from flower to flower, it deposits pollen on the next lobelia it explores. Achiapola owl is a bird you might think has a deformed bill, but Achiapola owl is a specialist. It uses its oddly shaped beak as a jackhammer, a crowbar, and a hook. It pecks at the bark of the native koa trees, and then it uses its crossbill to pry up the bark. It uses its curved upper jaw to pull out the beetle larvae it finds under the bark. These honey creepers are no longer the same species. They can no longer mate with each other. In fact, they're about as different from each other as cats and lions are. Yet all these birds have telltale DNA sequences that clearly show that they are distant cousins from a single family. Their overall genetic makeup more closely resemble each other than it does to all the other birds in the rest of the world. That's the beauty of the evolutionary process. It can create animals well suited to whatever resources are available. I believe this is God's process. He creates with his palate beautiful forms to fill the earth. His creation command, let the earth bring forth creatures of every kind, speaks life through the changing sequence and assortments of genes. Some Christians don't have any objections to evolution creating changes in species as long as it's within a particular kind of animal. In other words, they would say that since all these honey creepers are still birds, that that doesn't provide enough evidence that evolution could create larger differences such as those between a reptile and a bird. Yet recently, many fossils have been discovered which provide convincing evidence for this type of large change. For example, feathered dinosaur fossils, which were very well preserved, have shown that there's a strong link between reptiles and birds. A group of dinosaurs called the theropods are the most likely to have been the ancestors of modern day birds. There were many types of theropods, including the enormous T-Rex, but T-Rex couldn't have led to birds with its giant form and tiny arms. 
Back further in time, however, there was a much smaller theropod that gave rise to T-Rex and to other more bird-like dinosaurs. These smaller theropods had bird-like feet and ankles, and even a wishbone. Their bones were also hollow like birds. Some also had feathers on their arms and legs. Some sat on their eggs and tucked their noses behind their wing like birds do. You might be aware that birds have scales on their legs, claws, and shelled eggs like reptiles. But did you know that when a chick is in an egg, it has a three-fingered hand and a tail much like that of a dinosaur? These are ancestral characteristics that are transformed by just switching a few genes on and off. All this evidence supports the conclusion that the same process that happened for the honey creepers can not only cause different birds to arise from a common ancestor, it can cause larger changes as well. So why am I telling you all this? Why do I feel like it's so important that you see that God could create gradually rather than suddenly? It's because many times as young people go to college and they see for themselves that the data that supports evolution is so strong, they feel like they have to choose between the creator of the Bible and the seemingly godless random evolutionary process. And I want you to know that this is not a necessary choice. You can love Jesus and accept evolution.